This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Apology by Plato Translated by F. M. Stawell Read for you by J. P. Clace I do not know, men of Athens, what you have felt in listening to my accusers, but they almost made me even forget myself they spoke so plausibly. And yet, I may say, they have not spoken one word of truth, and of all the lies they told I wondered most at their saying that you ought to be on your guard against being misled by me, as I was a great speaker. To feel no shame when they knew that they would be refuted immediately by my own action, when I show you that I am not a great speaker at all, that did not seem to me the height of their audacity, unless perhaps they mean by a great speaker, a man who speaks the truth. If that is their meaning, I would agree that I am an orator, though not like them. For they, as I have told you, have said little or nothing that is true. From me you will hear the whole truth. Not, I assure you, that you will get fine arguments like theirs, men of Athens, decked out in their splendid phrases. No, but plain speech, set forth in any words that come to hand. I believe that what I have said is true, and I ask that none of you should look for anything else. Indeed, gentlemen, it would hardly suit my age to come before you like a boy with a made-up speech. And yet I do not ask one thing of you. And yet I do ask one thing of you, and I ask it very earnestly. If you find I speak in my defense, just as I have been accustomed to speak, over the banker's table in the marketplace, as many of you have heard me, there and elsewhere do not be surprised at it, and do not interrupt. For this is how the matter stands. This is the first time I have ever been in a lawsuit, and I am seventy years old, so I am really an entire stranger to the language of this place. Now just as you would have forgiven me, I am sure, had I been actually a foreigner, if I had spoken in the tongue and manner to which I had been born, so I think I have a right to ask you now to let my way of speaking pass, be it good or bad, and to give your minds to this question, and this only, whether what I say is right or not. This is the virtue of the judge, as truth is the virtue of the orator. Now in making my defense, men of Athens, it will be well for me to deal first with the first false accusation and my first accusers, and afterwards with those that have followed. For I have had many accusers who have come before you now for many years, and have not said one word of truth, and I fear them more than Antaeus and his supporters, though they are formidable too. But the others, gentlemen, are still more to be feared. I mean the men who took most of you in hand when you were boys, and have gone on persuading you ever since, and accusing me quite falsely, telling you that there is a man called Socrates, a philosopher, who speculates about the things in the sky, and has searched into the secrets of the earth, and makes the worst appear the better reason. These men, Athenians, the men who have spread this tale abroad, they are the accusers that I fear. For the listeners think that those who study such matters must be atheists as well. Besides, these accusers of mine are many, and they would have been at this work for many years, and that too when you were at an age when you would have been most ready to believe them, for you were young, some of you were mere striplings, and judgment had really gone by default, since there was no one to make the defense. And what is most troublesome of all, it is impossible even to find out their names unless there be a comedian among them. As for those who have tried to persuade you through envy and prejudice, some, it is true, convincing others because they were convinced themselves, these are the hardest to deal with of all. It is not possible to call upon any of them here and cross-examine them. One is compelled, as it were, to fight with shadows in making one's defense, and hold on inquiry where there is nobody to reply. So I would have you understand with me that my accusers have been, as I say, of two kinds, those who have just brought this charge against me, and others of longer standing, of whom I am speaking now. And I ask you to realize that I must defend myself against the latter, first of all, for they were the first whom you heard attack me and at much greater length than those who have followed them. And now, I presume, I must make my defense, men of Athens, and try in the short time I have before me to remove from your minds this calumny which has had so long to grow. I could wish for that result, and for some success in my defense, if it would be good for you and me. But I think it is a difficult task, and I am not unaware of its nature. However, let the result be what God wills. I must obey the law, and make my defense. Let us begin from the beginning, and see what the accusation is that gave birth to the prejudice on which Miletus relied when he brought his charge. Now what did they say to raise this prejudice? I must treat them as though they were prosecutors, and read their affidavit. Socrates, we say, is a trouble to the state. He is guilty of inquiring into the things beneath the earth, and the things of the firmament he makes the worse appear the better reason, and he teaches others so. This is the sort of thing they say. You saw it yourselves in the comedy of Aristophanes, 
a character called Socrates carried about in a basket, saying that he walked on air and talking a great deal more nonsense about matters of which I do not understand one word, great or small. And I do not say this in content of such knowledge, if anyone is clever at those things. May Miletus never bring so grave a charge against me. But in truth, gentlemen, I have nothing to do with these subjects. I call you yourselves, most of you, to witness. I ask you to instruct and tell each other, those of you who have ever heard me speak, and many of you have. Tell each other, I say, if any of you have ever heard one word from me, small or great, upon such themes, and you will realize from this that the other tales people tell about me are of the same character. There is, in fact, no truth in them at all, nor yet in what you have heard from others, that I try to make money by my teaching. Now here again, I think it would be a great thing if one could teach men as Gorgias of Leontini can, and Prodigious of Chaos, and Hippias of Alea. They can all go to every one of our cities and take hold of the young men who are able, as it is, to associate free of charge with any of their fellow citizens they may choose, and they can persuade them to leave this society for theirs, and pay them money, and be very grateful to them too. Why is there another philosopher here from Paros? He is in town, I know, for I happen to meet a friend of mine who has spent more money on sophists than all the rest put together, Callias, the son of Hipponicus. Now I put a question to him. He has two sons of his own. Callias, I said, if you have two sons or only colts or bullocks, we could have hired a trainer for them to make them beautiful and good, and all that they should be, and our trainer would have been, I take it, a horseman or a farmer. But now that they are human beings, have you any trainer in your mind for them? Is there anyone who understands what a man and citizen ought to be? I am sure you have thought of it because you have sons of your own. Is there anyone, I said, or not? Oh yes, said he, certainly there is. Who is he, I asked, and where does he come from, and how much does he charge? Eunice, he answered, from Peros, five minus a head. And I thought Eunice the happiest of men if he really has the power, and can teach for such a moderate fee. Now I should have been set up and given myself great airs if I possessed that knowledge, but I do not possess it, Athenians. Some of you will say, perhaps, but Socrates, what can your calling be? What has given rise to these calumnies? Surely if you had done nothing more than any other man, there would have not been all this talk had you never acted differently from other people. You must tell us what it is that we may not be left to make our own theories about you. This seems to me a fair question, and I will try to show you myself what it can be that has given me my name and produced the calumny. Listen to me, then. Some of you may think I am in jest, but I assure you I will only tell the truth. The truth is, men of Athens, that I have won my name because of a kind of wisdom, nothing more nor less. What can this wisdom be? The wisdom, perhaps, that is proper to man. It may really be that I am wise in that wisdom. The men I have just named may have a wisdom greater than man's, or else I do not know what to call it. Certainly I do not possess it myself. Whoever says I do lies and speaks to calumniate me. And pray, gentlemen, do not interrupt me, not even if you think I boast. The words I say will not be my own. I will refer you to a speaker whom you must respect. The witness I will bring you of my wisdom, if such it really is, and its nature, is the god whose dwelling is at Delphi. Now you know Caraphon, I think. He was my friend from boyhood and the friend of your democracy. He went with you into exile and came back with you. And you know, I think, the kind of man Caraphon was, how eager in everything he undertook. Well, he made a pilgrimage to Delphi, and had the audacity to ask this question from the oracle. And now I beg you gentlemen do not interrupt me in what I am about to say. He actually asked if there was any man wiser than me. And the priestess answered, no. I have his brother here to give evidence of this, for Caraphon himself is dead. Now see why I tell you this. I am going to show you how the calumny arose. When I heard the answer, I asked myself, what can the god mean? What can he be hinting? For certainly I have never thought myself wise in anything, great or small. What can he mean then when he asserts that I am the wisest of men? He cannot lie, of course, that would be impossible for him. And for a long while I was at a loss to think what he could mean. At last, after much thought, I started on some such course of search as this. I betook myself to one of the men who seemed wise, thinking that there, if anywhere, I should refute the utterance and could say to the oracle, This man is wiser than me, and you said I was the wisest. Now when I looked into the man, there is no need to give his name. It was one of our citizens, men of Athens, with whom I had had an experience of this kind. When we talked together, I thought, This man seems wise to many men, and above all to himself, but he is not so. And then I tried to show him that he thought he was wise, but he was not. Then he got angry with me, and so did many who heard us. But I went away and thought to myself, Well, at any rate, I am wiser than this man. 
Probably neither of us knows anything of beauty or good, but he thinks he knows something when he knows nothing, and I, if I know nothing, at least never suppose that I do. So it looks as though I really were a little wiser than he, just insofar as I do not imagine myself to know things about which I know nothing at all. After that, I went to another man who seemed to be wiser still, and I had exactly the same experience. And then he got angry with me too, and so did many more. Thus I went round them all, one after the other, aware of what was happening and sorry for it, and afraid that they were getting to hate me, but still I felt I must put the word of God first and foremost, and that I must go through all those who seemed to have any knowledge, in order to find out what the oracle meant. And by the dog, men of Athens, for I must tell you the truth, this was what I experienced. As I went on with the quest that God had imposed on me, it seemed to me that those who had the highest reputation were very nearly the most efficient of all, and that those who were thought inferior came nearer to being men of understanding. I must show you, you see, that my wanderings were a kind of labor of Hercules to prove to myself that the oracle was right. After I had tried the statesmen, I went to the poets, tragedians, writers of lyrics, and all, thinking that there I should take myself in the act and find I really was more ignorant than they. So I took up the poems of theirs in which they seemed to have spent most pains, and I asked them what they meant, hoping to learn something from them too. Now I am really ashamed to tell you the truth, but tell it I must. On the whole, almost all the bystanders could have spoken better about the poems than the men who made them, so here again I soon perceived that what the poets make is not made by wisdom, but by a kind of gift and inspiration, as with the prophets and the seers. They too utter many glorious sayings, but they understood nothing of what they say. The poets seemed to me in much the same state, and besides, I noticed that on account of their poetry they thought themselves the wisest of men in other matters too which they were not. So I left them also, thinking that I had just the same advantage over them as over the politicians. Finally, I turned to the men who work with their hands. I was conscious I knew nothing that could be called anything, and I was quite sure I should find that they knew a great many wonderful things. And in this I was not disappointed, they did know things that I did not, and in this they were wiser than me. But then, gentlemen, the skilled artisans in their turn seemed to me to have just the same failings as the poets. Because of his skill in his own craft, every one of them thought he was the wisest of men in the highest matters too, and this error of theirs obscured the wisdom they possessed, so that I asked myself on behalf of the oracle whether I would rather be as I am, without their wisdom and without their ignorance, or like them in both. And I answered for myself and for the oracle that it was better for me to be as I am. It was this inquiry, men of Athens, that gave rise to so much enmity against me, and that of the worst and bitterest kind. A succession of calumnies followed, and I received the surname of the wise, for those who meet me think me wise whenever I refute others. But, sirs, the truth may be that God alone has wisdom, and by that oracle he may have meant just this, that human wisdom is of little or no account. It seems as though he had not been speaking of Socrates the individual, but had merely used my name for an illustration, as if to say, He, O men, is the wisest of you all, who has learnt, like Socrates, that his wisdom is worth nothing. Such has been my search and my inquiry, ever since up to this day, in obedience to the god, whenever I found anyone, fellow citizen or foreigner, who might be considered wise. And if he did not seem so to me, I have borne God witness, and pointed out to him that he was not wise at all. And through this incessant work I have had no leisure for any public actions worth mentioning, nor yet for private affairs, but I live in extreme poverty. And through this incessant work I have had no leisure for any public actions worth mentioning, nor yet for my private affairs but I live in extreme poverty because of this service of mine to God. And besides this, the young men who follow me, those who have most leisure, sons of our wealthiest citizens, they take a keen delight among themselves in hearing people questioned, and they often copy me and try their hand at examining others on their own account, and I imagine they find no lack of men who think they know something, but know little or nothing at all. Now those whom they examine get angry, not with themselves, but with me, and say there is a man called Socrates, another scoundrel, who is ruining the young. And when anyone asks me what he does or what he teaches, they have really nothing whatever to say. But so as not to seem at a loss, they take up the accusations that lie ready to hand against all philosophers, and say that he speaks of the things in the heavens and beneath the earth, and teaches men not to believe in the gods, and to make the worse appear the better reason. The truth, I imagine, they would not care to say, namely, that they have been convicted of claiming knowledge where they have none to claim. And being, as I think they are, ambitious, energetic, and numerous, well organized, and using great powers of persuasion, they have gone on calumniating me with singular persistence and vigor till your ears are full of it all. After them, Miletus attacked me, and Antaeus and Lycon, Miletus on behalf of the poets, Antaeus for the artisans and the statesmen, 
Lycon for the orators, so that, as I said at first, I should be greatly surprised if in the short time before me I could remove the prejudice that has grown to be so great. There, men of Athens, that is the truth. I have not hidden one thing from you, great or small. I have not kept back one word. Yet I am fairly sure that I have roused hostility by so doing, which is in itself proof that what I say is true, and that the calumnies against me are of this nature, and the reasons those I have given. And if you look into the matter now or afterwards, you will find it to be so. Well, that is a sufficient defense and answer of my first accusers. Now I must try to defend myself against Miletus, the good man and the patriot as he calls himself, and the rest who followed. These are my second accusers, and let us take up their affidavit in its turn. It runs somewhat as follows. Miletus asserts that Socrates is guilty of corrupting the young and not believing in the gods in whom the city believes, but in some strange divinities. That is the sort of charge. Let us take it point by point. He does really say that I am guilty of corrupting the young, but I answer, men of Athens, that Miletus is guilty of an unseemly jest, bringing men to trial on a frivolous charge, pretending that he cares intensely about matters on which he has never spent a thought. That this is so, I will try to prove. Come here, Miletus, and tell me, you really think it of importance that our young men should be as good as possible? I do indeed. Well, will you tell the court who it is that makes them better? It is plain that you must know since you have given the matter thought. You have found, so you say, the man who corrupts them and me. You have accused me and brought me to trial before these judges. Go on and point out to them who it is that makes them better. See, Miletus, you are silent and have not a word to say. And now are you not ashamed? Is not this proof of what I say that you have never thought of it at all? Yet once more, my friend, I ask you, who it is that makes them better? The laws. No, my good fellow, that is not what I ask. I ask what man makes them better. And he, of course, must know the laws already. Well then, Socrates, I say these judges are the men. Really, Miletus, can these men really teach our youth and make them better? Most certainly they can. All of them, do you mean? Or only some? All of them. Splendid, splendid. What wealthy benefactors. And what of the audience? Can they do so or not? Yes, they can do so too. And what about the counselors? Yes, the counselors too. Well, Miletus, what of the assembly and those who sit there? They do not corrupt our young men, I suppose. All of them, too, you would say, make them better? Yes, all of them, too. Then it really seems that all the Athenians except me can make men good, and that I alone corrupt them. Is that what you mean? Yes, that is exactly what I mean. What a dreadful fate to be cursed with. But answer me. Have you the same opinion in the case of horses? Do you think that those who make them better consist of all mankind, with the exception of one single individual who ruins them? Or on the contrary, that there is only one man who can do them good, or very, very few the men, namely, who understand them, and that most people, if they use horses and have to do with them, ruin them? Is it not so, Miletus, with horses and all other animals too? Of course it is. Whether you and any to submit it or not, it would be well and more than well with our youth if there was only one man to corrupt them and all the others did them good. However, Miletus, you show us clearly enough that you have never considered our young men. You have made it quite plain that you care nothing about them, that you have never given a thought to the cause for which you have brought me here. Well, men of Athens, it has been plain for some time that Miletus, as I say, has never spent a thought on these matters, not one, great or small. Nevertheless, you must tell us, Miletus, how you think I corrupt the youth. No doubt, as you say in the indictment, by teaching them not to believe in the gods in whom our city believes, but in some new divinities. Is not that how you say I ruin them? Certainly I do, Socrates, as strongly as I can. Then, in the name of those gods of whom we speak, explain yourself more clearly to me and to the court. I have not been able to discover whether you say I teach belief in divinities of some kind, in which case I do, after all, believe in gods and am not another atheist. And so far I am not guilty, only they are not the gods in which the city believes. They are quite different, and that is your charge against me. Or perhaps you mean to say that I do not believe in gods of any kind, and that I teach others to do so. Yes, that is what I say. You do not believe in them at all. Miletus, Miletus, you astound me. What makes you say so? Then I do not even believe that the sun and the moon are gods, as other men believe? Most certainly, gentlemen of the court, most certainly, for he says the sun is stone and the moon earth. My dear Miletus, do you imagine you are attacking Anaxagoras? Or do you think so little of the jury, do you fancy them so illiterate as not to know that the books of Anaxagoras, the philosopher of the Clasomeni, are full of these theories? The young men, we are to suppose, learn them all from me, when they can buy them in the theater for ten pence at the most, and laugh at Socrates if he should pretend that they were his, especially when they are so extraordinary. Now tell me, is this what you really think, that I believe in no god at all? In none at all. I cannot believe you, Miletus. I cannot think you believe yourself. Men of Athens, I think this man an audacious scoundrel. 
I consider he has framed this indictment in a spirit of sheer insolence, aggression, and arrogance. One would think he is speaking in riddles to try whether the wise Socrates will discover that I am jesting and contradicting myself, or whether I shall deceive him and all who hear me. For he surely contradicts himself in his own indictment, almost as if he said, Socrates is guilty of not believing in gods, but believing in them. Such words can only be in jest. Look at the matter with me, gentlemen of the court, and see how it appears to me. And you must answer us, Miletus, and you, sirs, I ask you, as I asked you at first, not to interrupt me if I put the questions in my usual way. Now is there any man, Miletus, who believes that human things exist, but not human beings? Let him answer, sirs, do not allow him only to interrupt. Is there any who does not believe in horses, but does believe in their trappings? Or who does not believe in flute players, but does believe in flutes? There cannot be, my worthy man, for if you will not answer, I must tell you myself, and tell the court as well. But answer this at least, is there anyone who believes in things divine, and disbelieves in divinities? No, there is not. How kind of you to answer at last, under pressure from the court. Will you admit that I believe in things divine, and that I teach others so? They may be new, or they may be old, but at least, according to your own admission, I do believe in things that are divine, and you have sworn to this in your deposition. And if I believe in things divine, I must believe in divinities as well, is that not so? Indeed it is, for since you will not answer, I must assume that you assent. And do we not believe that divinities are gods, or only the sons of gods? You admit this? Yes, certainly. Well now, if you believe in divinities as you grant I do, and if divinities are gods of some kind, then this is what I meant when I said you were speaking in riddles and jesting with us, saying you do not believe in gods, and yet again that I do, since I believe in divinities. Again, if these divinities are the bastards of the gods, with nymphs and other women for their mothers, as people say they are, what man is there who could believe in the sons of God and not in gods? It would be as absurd as to believe in the offspring of horses and asses, and not to believe in horses and asses too. No, Miletus, it can only be that you were testing me when you drew up that charge, or else it was because you could find nothing to accuse me of with any truth. There is no possible way by which you could persuade any man of the least intelligence to doubt that he who believes in things divine and godlike must believe in divinities and gods, while he who disbelieves the one must disbelieve the other. However, men of Athens, I do not think much defense is needed to show that I am innocent of the charge Miletus has made. I think I have now said enough. But what I told you before, namely, that there is deep and widespread enmity against me, that, you must remember, is perfectly true. And this is what will overthrow me if I am overthrown. Not Miletus, nor yet Anetus, but the prejudice and envy of the majority, forces that have overthrown many a good man ere now, and will, I imagine, overthrow many more. There is little fear that it will end with me, but maybe some of you will say to me, Are you not ashamed of a practice that has brought you to the verge of death? And I have a good answer to give them. You are not right, my friend, so I would say, if you think that a man of any worth at all, however slight, ought to reckon up the chances of life and death, and not to consider one thing and one alone, that is whether what he has done is right or wrong, a good man's deed or a craven's. According to you, the sons of the gods who died at Troy would have been foolish creatures, and the son of Thetis above all, who thought so lightly of danger compared with the least disgrace, that when he was resolved to kill Hector, and when his mother, goddess as she was, spoke to him, to this effect if I remember right, My son, if you avenge the slaughter of your friend Patroclus, and kill Hector, you will die yourself. After the fall of Hector, death is waiting for you. Those were her words. But he, when he heard, thought scorn of death and danger. He was far more afraid to live a coward's life and leave his friend unavenged. Come death, then, he answered, when I have punished the murderer that I may not live on here in shame. Here by my longship's lying, a burden for earth to hear. Do you think that man cared for death or danger? Hear the truth, men of Athens. The post that a man has taken up because he thought it right himself or because his captain put him there, that post, I believe, he ought to hold in face of every danger, carrying no wit for death or any other peril in comparison with disgrace. So it would be a strange part for me to have played, men of Athens, if I had done as I did under the leaders you chose for me, at Potidea and Amphipolis and Delium, standing my ground like anyone else where they had posted me and facing death, and yet, when God as I thought and believed, had set me to live the life of philosophy, making inquiry into myself and into others, I were to fear death now or anything else, whatever, and desert my post. It would be very strange, and then, in truth, one would have reason to bring me before the court, because I did not believe in the gods, since I disobeyed the oracle, and was afraid of death, and thought I was wise where I was not. For to fear death, sirs, is to simply think we are wise when we are not so. It is to think we know what we know not. No one knows whether death is not the greatest of all goods that can come to man. 
and yet men fear it as though they knew it was the greatest of all ills. And is not this the folly that should be blamed, the folly of thinking we know what we do not know? Here again, sirs, it may be that I am different from other men, and if I could call myself wiser than anyone at any point, it would be for this, that I have no real knowledge about the world of death, so I never fancy that I have. But I do know that it is evil and base to do wrong and disobey the higher will, be it God's or man's. And so for the sake of evils, which I know right well are evils, I will never fear and never fly from things which are, it may be, good. Therefore, though you should acquit me now and refuse to listen to Anidas when he says that either I ought never to have been brought here at all, or else, now that I have been, it is impossible not to sentence me to death, assuring you that if I am set at liberty, your sons will at once put into practice all that I have taught them, and all become entirely corrupt. If, in face of this, you should say to me, Socrates, for this once we will not listen to Anidas, we will set you free, but on this condition, that you spend your time no longer in this search, and follow wisdom no more. If you are found doing it again, we will put you to death. If, I repeat, you were to set me free on this condition, I would answer you. Men of Athens, I thank you and I am grateful to you, but I must obey God rather than you. And while I have life and strength, I will never cease to follow wisdom and urge you forward, explaining to every man of you I meet, speaking as I have always spoken, saying, See here, my friend, you are an Athenian, a citizen of the greatest city in the world, the most famous for wisdom and for power. And are you not ashamed to care for money and money-making and fame and reputation, and not care at all, not make one effort for truth and understanding and the welfare of your soul? And should he protest and assert he cares, I will not let him go at once and send him away free, no. I will question him and examine him and put him to the proof, and if it seems to me that he has not attained to virtue, yet asserts he has, I will reproach him for holding cheapest what is worth most, and dearer what is worth less. This I will do for old and young, for every man I meet, foreigner and citizen, but most for my citizens, since you are nearer to me by blood. It is God's bidding, you must understand that, and I myself believe no greater blessing has ever come to you, or to your city, than this service of mine to God. I have gone about doing one thing, and one thing only, exhorting all of you, young and old, not to care for your bodies, or for money above or beyond your souls and their welfare, telling you that virtue does not come from wealth, but wealth from virtue, even as all other goods, public or private, the man can need. If it is by these words that I corrupt your youth, then these words do harm. But if anyone asserts that I say anything else, there is nothing in what he says. In face of this I would say, Men of Athens, listen to Anitus or not, acquit me, or acquit me not. But remember, I will do nothing else, not if I were to die a thousand deaths. No, do not interrupt me, Athenians. Keep the promise I asked you to give, not to interrupt what I had to say, but to hear it to the end. I believe it will do you good. I am about to say something else for which you might shout me down, only I beg you not to do so. You must understand that if you put me to death when I am the kind of man I say I am, you will not injure me so much as your own selves. Meletus or Anetus could not injure me, they have not the power. I do not believe it is permitted that a good man should be injured by a bad. He could be put to death, perhaps, or exiled, or disenfranchised, and it may be Miletus thinks, and others think, that these are terrible evils, but I do not believe they are. I think it is far worse to do what he is doing now, trying to put a man to death without a cause. So it comes about, men of Athens, that I am far from making my defense for my own sake, as might be thought. I make it for yours, that you may not lose God's gift by condemning me, for if you put me to death, you will not easily find another of my like. One might say, even if it sounds a little absurd, who clings to the city at God's command, as a gadfly clings to a horse, and the horse is tall and thoroughbred, but lazy from his growth, and he needs to be stirred up. And God, I think, has set me here to do something of the kind, to stir you up and urge you and prick each one of you and never cease, sitting close to you all day long. You will not easily find another man like that, and sirs, if you listen to me, you will not take my life, but perhaps you have been annoyed, as drowsy sleepers are when suddenly awakened, and you will turn on me and listen to Anetus, and be glad to put me to death. And then you will spend the rest of your life in sleep, unless God in his goodness sends you another man like me. That I am what I say I am, given by God to the city, you may realize from this. It is not the way of a mere man to leave all his own affairs uncared for and all his property neglected during so many years, and go about your business all his life, coming to each individual man as I have come, as though I were his father or his elder brother, and bidding him think of righteousness. If I had got any profit by this, if I had taken payment for these words, there would have been some explanation for what I did. But you can see for yourselves that my accusers, audacious and everything else, have yet not had the audacity to bring witnesses to assert that I have ever taken payment from any man, or ever asked for it. The witness I could bring myself in my own poverty would be enough, I think, to prove I speak the truth. 
It may perhaps seem strange to you that while I have gone about in private to give this counsel, and have been so busy over it, yet I have not found it in my heart to come forward publicly before your democracy and advise the state. The reason is one you have heard me give before, at many times and in many places, and it is this. I have a divine and supernatural sign that comes to me. Miletus referred to it scoffingly in his indictment. But in truth, it has been with me from boyhood, a kind of voice that comes over me. And when it comes, it always tells me back from what I intend to do. It never urges me forward. It is this which has stopped me from taking part in public affairs, and it did well, I think, to stop me. For you may be sure, men of Athens, if I had attempted to enter public life, I should have perished long ago without any good to you or to myself. Do not be angry with me if I tell you the truth. No man will ever be safe who stands up boldly against you or against any other democracy and forbids the many sins and crimes that are committed in the state. The man who is to fight for justice if he is to keep his life at all must work in private, not in public. I will give you a remarkable proof of this, a proof not in words, but in what you value, deeds. Listen and I will tell you something that happened to me, and you may realize from it that I will never consent to injustice at any man's command for fear of death, but would die on the spot rather than give way. What I have to tell you may seem an arrogant tale and a commonplace of the courts, but it is true. You know, men of Athens, that I have never held any other office in the state, but I did serve on the council. And it happened that my tribe, Antiochus, had the presidency at the time you decided to try the ten generals who had not taken up the dead after the fight at sea. You decided to try them in one body, contrary to the law, as you felt afterwards. On that occasion, I was the only one of the presidents who opposed you and told you not to break the law. And I gave my vote against it, and when the orators were ready to impeach and arrest me, and you encouraged them and hooted me, I thought then that I ought to take all the risks on the side of law and justice, rather than side with you when your decisions were unjust, through fear of imprisonment or death. That, while the city was still under the democracy. When the oligarchy came into power, the thirty, in their turn, summoned me with four others to the rotunda and commanded us to fetch Leon of Salamis from the island in order to put him to death, the sort of commands they often give to many others, anxious as they were, to incriminate all they could. And on that occasion I showed, not by words only, that for death, to put it bluntly, I did not care one straw, but I did care, and to the full, about what was wicked and unjust. I was not terrified then into doing wrong by the government and all its power. When we left the rotunda, the other four went off to Salmas and brought Leon back, but I went home, and probably I should have been put to death for it if the government had not been overthrown soon afterwards. Many people will confirm me in what I say. Do you believe now that I should have lived so long as this if I had taken part in public affairs and done what I could for justice like an upright man, putting it as I was bound to put it first and foremost? Far from it, men of Athens. Not I, nor any other man on earth. And all through my life you will find that this has been my character, in public, if ever I had any public work to do, and the same in private, never yielding to any man against right and justice, though you were one of those whom my calumniators call my scholars. But I have never been one's teacher. Only, if any man, young or old, has ever heard me at my work and wished to listen, I have never grudged him my permission. I have not talked with him if he would pay me, and refused him if he would not. I am ready for questions from rich and poor alike, and equally ready to question them should they care to answer me and hear what I have to say. And for that, if any one is the better or any one the worse, I ought not to be held responsible. I never promised instruction, I never taught, and if any man says that he ever learnt or heard one word from me in private, other than all the world could hear, I tell you he does not speak the truth. What then can it be that makes some men delight in my company? You have heard my answer, sirs. I told you the whole truth when I said their delight lay in hearing men exclaimed who thought they were wise but were not so. I told you the whole truth when I said their delight lay in hearing men examined who thought they were wise but were not so, and certainly it is not unpleasant. And I, as I believe, have been commanded to do this by God, speaking in oracles and in dreams, in every way by which divine grace has ever spoken to man at all and told him what to do. That, men of Athens, is the truth, and easy to verify. For, if it were really the case that I corrupt our young men and have corrupted them, then surely, now that they are older, if they have come to understand that I ever meant to do them harm when they were young, some of them ought to come forward here and now to accuse me and punish me. Or if they did not care to come themselves, some who were near to them, their fathers or their brothers, or others of their kin, ought to remember and punish it now, if it be true that those who are dear to them have suffered any harm from me. In fact, there are many of them here at this very moment. I can see them for myself. There is Crito, my contemporary, who belongs to the same deem as I. 
the father of Catabolus there, and there is Usanias of Sphedos, the father of Ichines, who is beside him, and Antiphon of Cephesia, the father of Epigenes, and others to whose brothers have spent their time with me, Nicostratus, the son of Theocitides, the brother of Theodotus. Theodotus is dead, so it cannot be his entreaty that has stopped his brother. And Prolus is here, the son of Demodocus, whose brother Theges was, and Adamantus, the son of Ariston, whose brother Plato I see, and Adandorus, and his brother Apollodorus too. And I tell you many more, one of whom, at least, Miletus should have called as a witness in this attack. Or, if he forgot them, let him call them now, and I will stand aside, and he can speak if he has anything to say. But, gentlemen, you will find it precisely the reverse. You will find them all prepared to stand by me. The man who has done the harm, the man who has injured their nearest and dearest, as Miletus and Anitus say. Those, perhaps, who are ruined themselves might have some reason for supporting me. But those who are uncorrupted, men of advancing years, their relatives, what other reason could they have for their support except the right and worthy reason that they know Miletus is lying and I am speaking the truth? There, gentlemen, that is the whole of what I had to say in my defense, with something more, perhaps, to the same effect. Now there may be a man among you who will feel annoyed if he remembers his own conduct when undergoing a trial far less serious than this of mine, how he prayed and supplicated the judges with floods of tears and brought his little children into court to rouse as much pity as possible, and others of his family and many of his friends. But I, it would appear, will not do anything of the kind, and that in the face, it may seem, of the utmost danger. Such a man, it may be, observing this, will harden himself against me. This one fact will enrage him, and he will give his vote in anger. If this is so with any of you, I do not say it is, but if it is, I think it would be reasonable for me to say, I too, my good man, have kindred of my own. I too was not born, as Homer says, from stock or stone, but from men, so that I have kinsfolk and sons also, three sons. The eldest of them is already a stripling, the other two are children. And yet I do not intend to bring one of them here or entreat you to acquit me. And why is it that I will not do anything of the kind? not from pride, men of Athens, nor from disrespect for you. Nor is it because I am at peace about death. It is for the sake of my honor and yours, and the honor of the city. I do not think it fitting that I should do such things, a man of my years, and with a name I bear. It may be true or false, but at any rate it is believed that Socrates is in some way different from most other men. And if those among you who bear a name for wisdom, or courage, or any other virtue were to act like this, it would be disgraceful. I have seen it often in others, who, when they came under trial, men of some repute, who behaved in a most extraordinary way, thinking, apparently, that it would be a fearful thing for them to die, as though they would be immortal if you did not put them to death. Such men, I think, bring disgrace upon the city, and any stranger might suppose that the Athenians who bore the highest name for virtue, who had been chosen out expressly for office and reward, were no whit better than women. We must not behave so, men of Athens those of us who are thought to be of any worth at all. And you must not allow it, should we try, you must make it plain, and quite plain, that you will be more ready to condemn the man who acts these pitiful scenes before you, and make the city absurd, than him who holds his peace. Even putting honor aside, gentlemen, it does not seem to me right to supplicate a judge and gain acquittal so. We ought rather to instruct him and convince him. The judge does not sit here and grant justice as a favor, but to try the case, he has sworn not that he will favor those he chooses, but that he will judge according to the law. So we should not teach you to break your oath, and you should not let yourselves be taught. Neither of us would reverence the gods if we did that. Therefore, you must not expect me, men of Athens, to act towards you in a way I do not think seemly or right or reverent, more especially when I am under trial for impiety and have Miletus here to face. For plainly, were I to win you over by entreaties and have you do violence to your oath, Plainly, I should be teaching you not to believe in the gods, and my own speech would accuse me unmistakably of unbelief. But it is far from being so, for I believe, men of Athens, as not one of my accusers believes, and I leave it to you, and to God, to decide my case as may be best for me and you. There are many reasons, men of Athens, why I feel no distress at what has now occurred. I mean your condemnation of me. It is not unexpected. On the contrary, I am surprised at the number of votes on either side. I did not think it would be so close. I thought the majority would be great, but in fact, so it appears, if only thirty votes had gone otherwise, I should have been acquitted. Against Miletus, as it is, I appear to have won, and not only so, but it is clear to everyone that if Anetus and Lycon had not come forward to accuse me, he would have been fined a thousand drachmas, for he would not have obtained a fifth part of the votes. The penalty he fixes for me is, I understand, death. Very good. 
And what am I going to fix in my turn, men of Athens? It must be, must it not, what I deserve? Well then, what do I deserve to receive or pay because I chose not to sit quiet all my life and turned aside from what most men care for, money-making and household affairs, leadership and war and public speaking, in all the offices and associations and factions of the state, thinking myself, as a matter of fact, too upright to be safe if I went into that life. So I held aloof from it all. I should have been of no use there to you or to myself, but I set about going in private to each individual man and doing him the greatest of all services, as I assert, trying to persuade every one of you not to think of what he had not, but rather what he has, and how he might grow wise and good, nor consider what the city had, but what the city was, and so with everything else in the world. What then do I deserve for this? A reward, men of Athens, if I am really to consider my deserts, and a reward, moreover, that would suit me. And what reward would suit a poor man who had been a public benefactor, who is bound to refrain from work because of his service in exhorting you? There could be nothing so suitable, men of Athens, as a place at the table in the President's Hall, far more suitable than if any of you had won a horse race at Olympia or a chariot race. The Olympian victor brings you fancied happiness, but I bring you real. He does not need maintenance, but I do. If I am to fix what I deserve in all fairness, then this is what I fix, a place at the table in the President's Hall. Perhaps when I say this you will feel that I am speaking much as I spoke about entreaties for pity, that is to say, in a spirit of pride. But it is not so, Athenians. This is how it is. I am convinced that I have never done wrong to any man intentionally, but I cannot convince you. We have only had a little time to talk together. Had it been the custom with you, as with other nations, to spend not one day, but many, on a trial for life and death, I believe I would have convinced you. But as matters are, it is not easy to remove a great prejudice in a little time. Well, with this conviction of mine that I have never wronged any man, I am far from meaning to wrong myself by saying that I deserve any harm or assigning myself anything whatever of the kind. What should I be afraid of? Of suffering what Miletus has assigned, when I say I do not know, after all, whether it is not good? and to escape it I am to choose what I know quite well is bad? And what punishment should I fix? Imprisonment? Why should I live in prison, slave to the eleven of the day? Or should I say a fine with imprisonment until I pay it? But then there's just the difficulty I mentioned a moment ago. I have no money to pay a fine. Or am I to say exile? You might, I know, choose for that punishment. My love of life would indeed be great if I were so blind as not to see that you, my fellow citizens, have not been able to endure my ways and words. You have found them too trying and too heavy to bear, so that you would want to get rid of them now. And if that is so, will strangers put up with them? Far from it, men of Athens. And it would be a grand life for a man of my years to go into exile and wander about from one city to another. For well I know that wherever I went the young men would listen to my talk as they listen here and if I drove them away, they would drive me out themselves and persuade their elders to side with them, and if I let them come, their fathers and kindred would banish me on their account. Perhaps some will say, But Socrates, cannot you leave us and live in peace and quietness? Now that is just what is hardest to make you, some of you, believe. If I were to say that this would be to disobey God, and therefore I cannot hold my peace, you would not believe me. You would say I was using my irony, and if I say again that it is in fact the greatest of all goods for a man to talk about virtue every day and the other matters on which you have heard me speaking and making inquiry into myself and others, if I say that the life without inquiry is no life for man, you would believe that even less. Yet it is so, even as I tell you, only it is not easy to get it believed. Moreover, I am not accustomed to think myself deserving of punishment. However, if I had had any money, I should have fixed a price that I could pay, for that would not have harmed me at all. But as it is, since I have no money, unless, perhaps, you would consent to fix only so much as I could afford to pay, perhaps I might be able to pay one mina silver, and I would fix it at that. But Plato here, gentlemen, Crito, and Christopolis, and Apollodorus beg me to say thirty minas, and they tell me they will guarantee it. So I will fix it at this sum, and these men, on whom you can rely, will be sureties for the amount." You have hastened matters a little, men of Athens, but for that little gain you will be called the murderers of Socrates the wise by all who want to find fault with the city. For those who wish to approach you will insist that I am wise, though I may not be so. Had you but waited a little longer, you would have found this happen of itself, for you can see how old I am, far on in life, with death at hand. In this I am not speaking to all of you, but only to those who have sentenced me to death, and to them I will say one thing more. It may be, gentlemen, that you imagine I have been convicted for lack of arguments, 
by which I could have convinced you, had I thought it right to say and do anything in order to escape punishment. Far from it. No, convicted have I been, for lack of, not arguments, but audacity and impudence and readiness to say what would have been a delight for you to hear, lamenting and bewailing my position, saying and doing all kinds of things unworthy of myself, as I consider, but such as you have been grown accustomed to hear from others. I did not think it right then to behave, through fear, unlike a freeborn man, and I do not repent now of my defense. I would far rather die after that defense than live upon your terms. As in war, so in a court of justice. Not I, nor any man, should scheme to escape death by any and every means. Many a time in battle, it is plain the soldier could avoid death if he flung away his arms and turned to supplicate his pursuers, and there are many such device in every hour of danger for escaping death, if we are prepared to say and do anything whatever. But, sirs, it may be that the difficulty is not to flee from death, but from guilt. Guilt is swifter than death, and so it is that I, who am now slow and old, have been caught by the slower pace, and my accusers, who are clever and quick, by the quick-footed, by wickedness. And now I am to go away, under sentence of death, from you, but on them truth is past sentence of unrighteousness and injustice. I abide by the decision, and so must they. Perhaps, indeed, it had to be just so, and I think it very well. And now that it is over, I desire to prophesy to you, you who have condemned me. For now I have come to the time when men can prophesy, when they are to die. I say to you, you who have killed me, punishment will fall on you immediately after my death, far heavier for you to bear than your punishment of me. For you have done this thinking to escape the need of giving any account of your lives, but exactly the contrary will come to pass, and so I tell you, those who will call you to account will be more numerous. I have kept them back till now, and you have not noticed them, and they will be the harder to bear inasmuch as they are younger, and you will be troubled all the more. For if you think that by putting men to death you can stop everyone from blaming you for living as you should not live, I tell you you are mistaken. That way of escape is neither feasible nor noble. The noblest way, and the easiest, is not to maim others, but to fit ourselves for righteousness. That is the prophecy I give to you who have condemned me, and so I leave you. But with those that have acquitted me, I should be glad to talk about this matter, until the archons are at leisure, and I go to the place where I am to die. So I will ask you, gentlemen, to stay with me for the time. There is no reason why we should not talk together while we can, and tell each other our dreams. I would like to show you, as my friends, what can be the meaning of this that has befallen me. A wonderful thing, my judges, for I may call you judges and not call you amiss. A wonderful thing has happened to me. The warning that comes to me, my spiritual sign, has always in all my former life been most incessant, and has opposed me in the most trifling matters whenever I was about to act amiss. And now there has befallen me, as you see yourselves, what might really be thought, as it is thought, the greatest of all evils. And yet, when I left my home in the morning, the signal from God was not against me, nor when I came up here into the court, nor in my speech, whenever I was about to say, and yet at other times it has often stopped me in the very middle of what I was saying, but never once in this matter has it opposed me in any word or deed. What do I suppose to be the reason? I will tell you. This that has befallen me is surely good, and it cannot possibly be that we are right in our opinion, those of us who hold that death is an evil. A great proof of this has come to me. It cannot be that the well-known signal would have stopped me, unless what I was going to meet was good. Let us look at it this way, too, and we shall find much hope that it is so. Death must be one of two things. Either it is to have no consciousness at all of anything whatever, or else, as some say, it is a kind of change in migration of the soul from this world to another. Now if there is no consciousness at all, and it is like sleep when the sleeper does not dream, I say there would be a wonderful gain in death, for I am sure if any man were to take that night in which he slept so deeply and he saw no dreams, and put beside it all the other nights and days of his whole life, and compare them, and say how many of them were well better spent or happier than the one night, I am sure that not the ordinary man alone, but the king of Persia himself, who would find them few to count. If death is of this nature, I would consider it a gain, for the whole of time would seem no longer than one single night. But if it is a journey to another land, if what some say is true, and all the dead are really there, if this is so, my judges, what greater good could there be? If a man were to go to the house of death, and leave all these self-styled judges to find the true judges there, who, so it is said, give justice to that world, Minos, and Radamanthus, and Achis, and Triptolamus, and all the sons of the gods who have done justly in this life. Would that journey be ill to take? Or to meet Orpheus, and Messias, and Hesiod, and Homer? 
What would you give for that, any of you? I would give a hundred deaths if it is true. And for me especially, it would be a wonderful life there if I met Palamedes and Ajax and the son of Telamon or any of the men who had died by an unjust decree. To compare my experiences with theirs would be full of pleasure, surely. And best of all, to go on still with the men of that world as with the men of this, inquiring and questioning and learning who is wise among them, and who may think he is but is not. How much would one give, my judges, to question the hero who led the host at Troy, or Odysseus, or Sisyphus, or any of the countless men and women I could name? To talk with them there, and live with them, and question them would be happiness unspeakable. Certainly they will not put one to death for that. They are far happier in all things than we of this world, and they are immortal forevermore, if what some say is true. And you too, my judges, must think of death with hope, and remember that this at least is true, that no evil can come to a good man in life or death, and that he is not forgotten of God. What has come to me now has not come by chance, but it is clear to me that it was better for me to die and be quit of trouble. That is why the signal never came to turn me back, and I cannot say that I am altogether angry with my accusers and those who have condemned me. Yet it was not with that intention that they condemned me and accused me. They meant to do me harm, and they are to be blamed for that. This much, however, I will ask of them. When my sons come of age, sirs, will you reprove them and trouble them as I troubled you, if you think they care for money or anything else more than righteousness? And if they seem to be something when they are really nothing, reproach them as I reproached you for not seeking what they need, and for thinking they are somewhat when they are worth nothing. And if you do this, we shall have received justice at your hands, my sons and I. But now it is time for me to go, I to death and you to life and which of us goes to the better state is known to none but God.